Hi everyone, this is Kevin Wagner, the Keto Advocate. In January of 2016, I had the privilege to sit down and chat with Dr. Colin Champ at the first annual conference on nutritional ketosis and metabolic therapeutics held in Tampa, Florida. Let's see what Dr. Champ had to say. Sure, um, so I work at University of Pittsburgh, a uh, radiation oncologist there, an assistant professor in radiation oncology. Uh, and I also help to run the integrative oncology department there. My focus is, uh, my research focus is on diet, exercise, nutrition, and how they both synergize with uh, current treatments like radiation therapy. And ideally, we're trying to look uh, for preventative mechanisms as well. Could you tell us about the topic you'll be speaking about here at the conference? Sure. So generally, just the ketogenic diet, which has been one such uh, way we're looking to synergize treatments. Um, basically a historical perspective, and then kind of my, I guess my opinions, whether they wanted my opinions or not, they're going to get my opinions on, on how it will synergize with treatment and what I think the future kind of holds for the ketogenic diet. Where could we find more information on you and your work? Uh, so my works, my, my publications are all on PubMed. Uh, I have a personal website, colinchamp.com, which is just my more personal musings on life in general, but a lot of that's on the ketogenic diet and tumor metabolics. And then uh, Caveman Doctor is a site that I started years back as a resident to kind of take complex topics and make them a little more simple for the, I don't, I don't want to say the layperson, but for anyone to, to read and find out more about cancer. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, currently, we have a study about to go through the IRB where we're looking at uh, using the ketogenic diet to synergize with both chemotherapy and radiation, and we're also giving uh, some metabolic agents to interact with the ketogenic diet. And I don't want to get into too many specifics, but um, you know the feeling. Obviously, there's a view that metabolic uh, cancer is seen as at least partially a metabolic disease. Obviously, a controversial topic. Uh, so the ketogenic diet that that gives it a lot of options how it can interact with treatments. Whether it's a treatment itself, I think is a little, a lot more controversial, uh, but whether it can interact with current treatments or even alleviate toxicities of future metabolic treatments is really what we're trying to look at. Well, there's lo lots of those. Um, you know, blocking the nutrients that cancer cells take up, and there's a couple of them, is definitely a good, uh, a good study to do. And ketosis can be done with those because it's kind of like an escape mechanism for our normal cells. So it's a way for them to derive energy while starving the cancer cells. Uh, people on a ketogenic diet in itself would starve the cancer cells. And I guess it's more of a, a continuum if you have high blood sugar, that's bad. So if you get it lower with, with a ketogenic diet, which we've shown to be feasible, we've published that, um, that can at least lower the blood sugar levels. Uh, it'd be nice to have some large scale trials to see whether that affects survival or not. Uh, Dr. Sheck's doing one of those right now in Arizona. Um, but we know we can't get it to a low enough level just through diet alone. So we're gonna have to start looking at other uh, ways to do that. And you know, these are all hypotheses and I think they're interesting. I think the preclinical data is compelling and I'm hoping the studies in humans will be fruitful but um, they're tough studies to run. You know, you need tons of people, you need people to eat a certain diet, which is very difficult. So you have to potentially supply the food. You have to watch them closely. It's not as simple as taking a pill. So there's a lot of challenges. I mean, the ideal study would be a study with a thousand people in a metabolic ward with everything paid for. So I'm not holding my breath on that one, but. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of different interactions. Uh, carbohydrates have been a major target as of lately, um, obviously counter to fat, which was a target decades ago. Uh, there's a couple of reasons when we eat carbohydrates or our sugar, our blood sugar gets high, uh, we secrete this hormone called insulin and that shuttles the sugar out of our cell, or excuse me, out of our blood and into our cells. Unfortunately, both sugar and insulin can bind to some pathways that can increase both cancer occurrence and cancer growth. So that's one of, the major, one of the major reasons. It can also cause inflammation. And indirectly, eating a poor diet, one that increases the amount of fat tissue on your body, uh, can increase inflammation. So the way I view it is our fat tissue basically works as a, 
endocrine organ, secreting inflammatory factors, can secrete hormones that can increase the risk for breast cancer and prostate cancer. So there's, there's just so much overlap. Um, I, my research deals with food synergizing with cancer treatment, which I'm hopeful for, but the data regarding food in terms of preventing cancer is obviously a lot more plentiful. Um, so <clears throat> I think Craig Thompson, he's a, I think he's still the chair of Memorial Sloan Kettering, said it best. Um, fats really don't do much in regards to that. Proteins do a little and carbohydrates do a lot. It's because of those pathways that we just discussed, the insulin, insulin receptor, even the metabolic dysregulation that, that high sugar diets cause. And then proteins kind of in the middle because uh, it can upregulate this thing called mTOR and that could lead to tumor induction and progression and those kind of things. And these are targets that we're actively trying to hit with, with chemotherapeutic agents right now, or targeted agents. So the fact that food directly overlaps with those agents uh, is, is quite powerful. So for instance, with breast cancer, a lot of times breast, cells, uh, breast cancer cells have estrogen and progesterone receptors on them. So these hormones can basically bind to them feed them or at least signal to them to grow or to, to metastasize or to live. So we give drugs to block those hormones uh, and one of those drugs actually blocks the conversion in the fatty tissue of those hormones. So in theory, if you have less fat, you're gonna have less of those hormones roaming around. Also, uh, inflammation, cancer cells love inflammation. I've heard it referred to as, as like the fertilizer in the, in the soil. Uh, so the more fatty tissue you have, the more inflammation you have. So breast cancer is a really been linked strongly to being overweight, having increased risk, having increased risk of it coming back. Women that gain weight during treatment have a much higher risk of recurring after treatment. And then other cancers like prostate cancer and esophageal cancer are pretty closely related to obesity as well. Yeah, that's a tougher, tougher question. I think it can. Um, I'm hopeful that it can. I think the preclinical, the animal data is quite compelling. Um, I, I don't know of any data in humans where a diet in itself can cure cancer. And you know, obviously we all wish that was the case. So I think it can synergize with, with cancer treatments. Um, there's even studies where if patients fast and it improves their quality of life. So the question is, is it, can it improve quality of life? Can it improve outcomes or does it do something in between? And I, I'm, I think it does, you know, it's a, it's a hypothesis and a bunch of us are trying to prove it, um, but there's definitely not data out there right now showing that it does. Um, I think there's gonna be more and more studies looking at it with uh, current treatments. Again, Dr. Sheck's study is with uh, Temidart's chemotherapy and radiation for high grade brain tumors. That's where a lot of the preclinical data came in. Uh, her own data and also Dr. Seafried's data. So those studies are already taking place. Uh, we're hoping that it can improve treatment or at least improve quality of life. Again, I think that when more metabolic agents come into play, there's studies with metformin, which is basically a metabolic medication that type 2 diabetics take. Uh, when more of these metabolic uh, treatments come into play, I wouldn't be surprised if the ketogenic diet uh, comes in hand in hand with them. I believe so. I think um, while there's no perfect one diet for everyone, it only stands to reason that a diet makes you healthier in regards to weight, in regards to blood sugar levels, uh, in regards to blood pressure would also be one that would also lower your risk of, of cancer. And a lot of the data now is showing that. Uh, again, carbohydrates as of recently have been a, a big target. Um, they're clearly very important. I think a lot of that is because of the dietary mistakes that we've made in the United States. Um, so we know that if we mitigate the risks from those foods, we can decrease the risk of both causing cancer and ideally uh, treating cancer. So again, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I do, um, and these are, again, these are studies that are difficult to perform in people. So there's a lot of animal studies out there. So really a lot of this is just reviewing the data, seeing what makes sense. And I look at these things kind of from a ancestral and evolutionary perspective and historical perspective as well. So a lot of these activities that we did in the past for several million years, it only stands to reason that they're healthy. And now we see studies where they're fasting cancer patients. I think, uh, I think in California there's a, a study where 
patients fasted for around 36 hours around chemotherapy. There's ketogenic diet. That's, again, something that we encountered when carbohydrates or fruits or those kind of foods were sparse in the winter. Uh, fasting, again, uh, intense exercise. All these kind of things are showing to have some metabolic benefits. It could potentially either offset the induction of cancer or improve treatment. So those are things I do personally. And again, maybe they won't make a difference, but the data is quite compelling. So I hope and believe that, that they do. And again, until we prove these things in humans, we can't make definitive recommendations, but there's something that makes sense to me, so I personally do them. Ma maintaining cancer as more of a chronic disease, um, it, it's certainly happening more often now. So for instance, breast cancer patients that are metastatic can live for years and years and years. Prostate cancer patients that are metastatic can live for years and years and years. Some of the more aggressive tumors like glioblastoma and these types of tumors, you, you kind of see less of that. There's either an active phase or an inactive phase. So the question of turning cancer into a chronic disease with diet alone, again, there's not a ton of of data with the immunotherapies, they're certainly seeing that as well. We're seeing these patients with metastatic disease having complete responses, living longer, but you still kind of know the cancer is lurking there. So if we could see metabolic therapies or dietary therapies coming in hand in hand with immunotherapies, I think that would be that would be great. Again, we're hopeful, and with the immunotherapies, there has been a lot of talk of overlap of these of these topics. So I think if if we get these studies rolling, um, the future will be bright. Yeah, so the, uh, there's th different reasons why different uh, researchers are looking at GBM. So a lot of the earlier studies came from that. So that's one main reason. Um, the blood-brain barrier lets things in or out. So in theory, we can create a hyperketotic, like a hyper-concentrated environment within the brain where you can't do that in other parts of the body. So that was another, another reason. Again, the data on that is, is a lot of animal studies because we can't obviously do those studies in humans. Um, the other thing is that the treatment for GBM is inadequate, and everyone in the medical field agrees, you know, we're not getting the survivals that we want. Um, and that, I mean, that's any field of cancer, but GBM is, is really, really bad in that regard. So it's, it's kind of a, a catch-22 because we're picking one of the hardest challenges to apply the diet to. So then if it doesn't work at all, does that mean it's a failure? You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's tough to say. Um, other, other sites that it would help, in theory, are those that are more metabolically active. It's kind of an easy way to look at it would be those that have necrosis or those that light up a lot on a PET scan. So head and neck has been discussed, there's been discussion of head and neck, uh, cervical cancer, esophageal cancer, um, tumors like that. Some people have even decided or discussed rectal cancer because you do chemo and radiation first. You could do the diet with it after you do the surgery so you could actually see the response from it. But generally, the metabolically active cancers are the ones. What about hematologic? Hematologic, the data's been, there's been not a lot of data on it, and I'm digging deep in my, my brain here, but I, I, I could, I thought there was a study that, that it was less, less uh, efficacious in hematologic. And again, these are all, there's a lot of extrapolation here, so it's, it's tough to really say. So that's, yeah, like Gene Fine, for instance, who did one of the earlier studies, you know, he always talks about prostate cancer cells and how it's probably less efficacious because they're not pet avid. Then there is a bunch, uh, there's a handful of preclinical studies uh, from Dr. Friedland where he was looking at ketogenic diets on mice with prostate cancer cells and showed it to be efficacious. The issue there is um, these are mice where they inject the tumors into their bellies and then they put them on a ketogenic diet. So maybe it's just stopping the, the tumors from implanting mm -hmm. appropriately, right? It's yeah. not like, it's not a, a native model of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Sheck's studies, she put brain tumor cells in the brain and then let them grow. So I think that's a little more, I don't wanna say reasonable because these studies are difficult to run, but it makes a little more sense. Um, what I think of those studies, and again, this is just my opinion, is that it shows that diet is good for preventative uh, mechanism. Right, if you're injecting these tumor cells and maybe they're just not forming as well as they would. And if we're exposed to cancerous things every day, perhaps a diet can help offset this. Uh, again, this is nearly impossible to run a study in humans where you can assess that. 
So that being said, there was a response to the diet alone, to the ketogenic diet, and those are in prostate cancer cells. So does that mean that maybe they are more affected from it? Or it's, it's like so tough to tell with these studies. So metastatic is, is tough. I mean, the mouse models, I know that it slowed it in a couple, but it's, it's like GBM. In humans, metastatic, like for instance, metastatic lung cancer is just such a ferocious beast. It's hard to think that the diet is gonna, uh, by itself, is gonna help to maintain that. And it's, it's and I'm gonna talk about this in my talk, it's, it's good and bad news. Um, you know, if it does help for preventative, that's, that's actually very good news, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, unfortunately, I think by itself, it's going to be tough for some of these. There's a, you know, these cancer cells are so glucose hungry. Um, once they get, there's a, this AKT mutation, they just pull in whatever glucose they can. So you can lower your glucose with the diet. Some people don't lower the glucose with the diet, but you can offset maybe high glucose from steroids, but you're not going to get it down to that, to zero, obviously, or it's going to be hard to get up below 70. So that is a topic of like everyone I know that I have a, I know a couple of dietitian Patricia Daly who's written a book um, she's on one herself we've discussed like when is it okay to come off and it's tough because one it's like is it working or not by itself we don't really know there's not enough there's not a big enough study so then the question is if they're fine with it and they're comfortable with it and they enjoy it then you know you can stay on it um, for some people it's a real challenge and so. The question, the first off, the question is how to make it less of a challenge so that people that want to be on it can be on it and so that we can adequately test it. But in terms of do you need to stay on it, it's, it's an unanswerable question. And like a, uh, Dr. Sheck's study, you know, some, the mice, she took them off it because she saw them as being cured. And her data was quite good. And these are small numbers, of course. So that would maybe suggest you don't, but then other people are so adamant that you do and again, it's based, that's what happens when you have this heterogeneity of, of preclinical animal studies. It's kind of, you can take out whatever you, you want from it.